Welcome. This is the Life Habits Podcast Series. My name is Carl Vredenberg. And my name is Paige Heron. This is the series that helps you to learn new habits to optimize your life and embrace an enlightened, healthy, and prosperous lifestyle. And today, I'll be dealing with the topic of feeding your soul with meaning and purpose. It's a topic that's been dear to my heart and a focus of mine for most of my adult life. It's also about opening the aperture on your life and not only feeding your wallet through your gainful employment, but also feeding your soul with purpose and meaning. So let's start as we usually do with some inspirational quotes. Let's start with one from Daniela Mikolova, who says, feed your soul by feeding the souls of others with love, kindness, and compassion. The next one comes from Winston Churchill. It's not enough to have lived. We should be determined to live for something. Germany Kent says, stand for something. Make your life mean something. Roy Bennett says, if you have a strong purpose in life, you don't have to be pushed. Your passion will drive you there. Bishop Jake says, if you can't figure out your purpose, find your passion, for your passion will lead you right into your purpose. Washington Irving says, great minds have purposes, others have wishes. Barbara Mikulski said, each of us can make a difference. Together, we can make change. Matthew Kelly says, whatever change you desire in the world, create that change in your own life. You're here for a purpose. Seek it out. Hunt it down. The greatest misery is to be purposeless. And you know, there was a quote that was shared by Eve Turo Paul, who we had on the podcast a number of episodes ago. And I also just heard Brene Brown talk about it as well. And I think it's very meaningful. It's long, but it really gets at the heart of putting yourself out there and really doing what you think is right for the world and withstanding any resistance or criticism. It's by Theodore or Teddy Roosevelt. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions? Who spends himself in a worthy cause? Who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement? And who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails with daring greatly? so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Again, a long quote, but I think one that really reinforces that if we want to really feed our soul and make a real difference in the world, we have to stand forward, be counted, and have the resolve to continue despite criticisms, or quite frankly, failures. And the critic who just sits back and observes is really not the one we're talking about here. And this all feeds into one of my favorite lines that when people say, someone should do something about that, I say, why not me? Or with a group of other people, why not us? I think we need more people that take that perspective on life, we could improve the world a whole lot faster and a whole lot better if that were the case. So let me first share 
some of my own experiences on this topic, because it really has been a passion of mine my entire life. Some time ago, when I was speaking with friends and some colleagues, there are two particular instances that I would like to relate to you. One is a number of friends who just aren't positive, who are critical of life, they're critical of themselves, and they're kind of waiting for the world to turn them a better deed, to improve their lives and their experience in their life. I also was at a dinner a while ago with friends and colleagues where the nature of the conversation at one point was all about how stressed everyone was and how they're getting burnt out. And there were tears involved, really strong emotion. And when we went around the table and talked about what we were actually doing, it was realization that the people that were the most stressed and the most burnt out were the people that were spending virtually all of their time on work, on their paid employment, and were basically wedded to their jobs and to their careers. And I shared that I didn't have that same perspective that they did in terms of being burnt out and being stressed beyond belief. And I attributed that to not only feeding my wallet with my work, but also always having another outside interest outside of work that really fed my soul. So not defining myself with my job, but still working very, very hard at it and putting in a lot of hours in, but still not identifying solely with that and that being the definition of me, for example, in terms of my work. And so I have done a number of things over the years that have really kept me in balance. And that when things were hard at work or there was some criticism involved and the like, I could feel better about the fact that I was helping other people. For example, I reach out regularly to people on social media platforms that are posting something that shows that they're in need and they're hurting. And I then reach out to them and work with them. I have some of my greatest friends are actually people that are reached out to in that way. That gives me a real sense of purpose, a real sense of feedback that I am making a difference, a positive difference, you know, in, in the world. I would also be doing my teaching at university and doing, you know, keynote presentations at conferences and the like, and also serving on boards of directors of nonprofit organizations that were focused on kind of improving the world. And again, if I had a hard day at work, I could feel better because that evening, if I were teaching a class and everything that I was doing in that role actually was really appreciated by the students and quite frankly, also built up my ego again, if my ego was hurt in dealings that I had at work, all of that made my life more balanced. So that's one of the reasons why we want to do this conversation. Some other examples of things that I've done, I've been an advocate for animal rights for many years. I volunteered for an organization in the area for a long time. And as, as I said, I also worked as the vice president of the board of directors of that nonprofit. It was called VegTO that had a mission to inspire people to choose vegan living for the animals, our health, and the planet. We would hold, and we still do, I'm no longer in that role, but a big festival that would bring in 25 to 30,000 people in Toronto, where I'm based, to introduce them to a, a different way of living that would be more positive for the world in terms of climate change, more impactful in terms of improving human health, and also lessening the damage and suffering for animals as well. I also worked with the World Design Organization, 
Design for America and IBM Design, volunteers from each of those organizations, to launch what we call the COVID Design Challenge. We had some 250 volunteers that really worked on promoting safe behaviors, supporting our healthcare professionals and our frontline workers during the pandemic. And everybody that was part of that organization also felt really good about the fact that they were making a contribution and making a difference. Also teamed up with Don Norman to launch the Future of Design Education Initiative with more than 600 volunteers and a number of leaders from education as well as from practice. And our objective there was to inject into the design education curriculum more of a focus on designing for the world and designing for the climate, designing for the earth, and also being aware of the global south and not only focusing on the global north. A number of very worthwhile and I think really important ways for improving the world and actually injecting that into the design education curriculum. And more recently, Carly Williams and I got together about a year ago to talk about how we could use research and design, something that I am knowledgeable in depth about, and filmmaking, something that she is very effective at, to address the major challenges in the world, like climate change, animal and human suffering, food insecurity, human illness, biodiversity loss, through documentary-inspired behavior changes. We now have some 300 volunteers that are working with us to do exactly that. And many of those people that volunteered for that project are also feeding their soul in the way that we're talking about in this episode. My mentoring over the years and now my coaching has also been a form of feeding my soul. I initially went into psychology, cognitive science, and then clinical psychology because I felt that I had a calling of sorts to help people. I also reached out to strangers, as I mentioned before, on social media. And what's interesting about all of that is that that also is really part of my mission for having started this podcast series some 16 and a half years ago as well to make a difference. And the feedback over the years that I've received on the impact that it's had on people's lives has been really positive. And I find that feeds my soul. There are days that I think about kind of the money that I would work for and what it made me felt like versus getting an email from somebody listening to a particular podcast episode and telling me that I helped them save their marriage or in one case, actually preventing them from committing suicide. So that is worth way, way, way more than any money in my view. But that's my particular focus on the ways that I like to feed my soul. So I'd like to take you next through really my three suggestions for things that you can do to take stock of where you are in your life with regard to this topic. Some of you, based on a poll that I ran on LinkedIn, some of you are not focused on this topic at all. Others of you are getting purpose through your work. And others of you are finding ways of feeding your soul outside of work as well. And some of the ideas and things that you shared are also quite meaningful, but there might be other things that you want to dig in more deeply by going through the three exercises that I'm going to share right now that will allow you to step back, take stock, and think about, are there any other things you'd like to do to really bring more balance, to bring more, more purpose and meaning to your life as well? So the first suggestion comes from Stephen R. Covey. You know, the last episode, I talked about the major lessons that have informed my life. And I talked about the lessons from Stephen Covey's book and books all about highly effective people and habits for how to be 
very effective. I also talked about my mother's lessons to me as well. But one of the most important lessons from Stephen R. Covey, I also even covered in the first episode of this entire podcast series. And it's basically called the deathbed test or also called the funeral test. And the way that it works is this. Imagine that you're attending your own funeral. I know that's a morbid thought, but honestly, really try to get yourself into imagining what that would be like. Who would be at your funeral? Think about the physical space you'd be in, the music that would be flowing through the air. And think about the people that are going to be walking up to the podium to commemorate your life. What would they say about you? I would bet that they're not likely going to be saying things like, it was really good that he finished a particular report on time or landed a big sale. They'll talk about what impact that you've had on them and on the world. Now, think through what you would like them to say. Imagine you're in that same situation, and maybe some of you will be summarizing and thinking about what people would say when they got to the podium, and that you're already perfectly fine with everything that they would say about you. I congratulate you. You are leading a balanced life of purpose and meaning. If, on the other hand, you found that somewhat wanting and lacking, and that you would like to be remembered for more than what occurred to you, then think about what kinds of things you would like to be remembered for. And when you think about that, that's going to start you down the path of saying, these are things that are what I want to be known for. These are the things that I want to be spending time on now. And often we're not spending time on them. A lot of the time we say, well, I'll get around to that. I'm too busy right now. I've work is too busy. My family life is too busy. Well, then you may get to the end of your life and still not have done the things you really care that you should be doing. So think about what the themes would be that you would like to be remembered for and what you want to now focus on in your life, maybe in addition to anything else that you're doing today. And then think too about the job that you have currently, the role that you have, and think about whether you'd like to make a change in that. Now, that's often difficult in times of a tough job market, which at least right now we're going through, but these episodes are listened to many months and years in the future. So you may be at a time or your particular discipline or industry is in an upward trend, in which case you could more easily go to another role. So if your current role doesn't satisfy the basics of what you would like with regard to the purpose that you want to contribute to the world, consider making a change and going to some other Role. I know people that have done that and gone from, you know, a for-profit organization to a non-profit one and finding that so much more effective in the sense that they'll be making less money, but they're feeding their soul more effectively. And that's your call to make, of course, and we need money to live. And a lot of the time, non-profit jobs aren't as lucrative as for-profit ones are. And if you're not able to or wanting to change your role, I want to think about how you can reframe the role that you have and define a purpose that is more than simply making more money for the company that you work for or the organization that you work for. The example that I would give is the one that I gave the teams that I led as a vice president uh, at IBM 
for the last two years that I was at the company before I retired three months ago. And I tried to provide a purpose for the user experience researchers that I led and really tried to share that their higher purpose beyond simply making money for the company was to improve the lives of the people that would be using the software that they were working on, to be able to be happier, to be uh, more productive, uh, to be able to finish work more quickly and spend time with their family and their friends and the like. So seeing their purpose as serving the needs and improving the lives of the people that would be using the products that they were working on. And that really refocuses your attention on what it is that you're doing. It also changes the way that you think about your job. Now, all of a sudden, you're not just doing what you need to be doing or whatever your boss wants you to do and the like. Now you're going to take more of a personal interest in really making a difference in the purpose that you have in serving, for example, the people that are using your product or might use your product in the future. And when you do that, what happens? The company is more successful too, right? So reframing your current role in this way can serve you better in terms of feeding your soul as well as feeding your wallet. Now, your job and your role and your profession and your career needn't feed all of you. You don't have to get all of your satisfaction from your job. You can do your job. You can refactor it in the way that I just talked about and reframe. But you may also want to or need to explore volunteer opportunities to satisfy your desire to you know, re- feed your soul and to be focused on purpose and meaning. And there are a variety of ways of doing that. You can reach out to organizations that already exist that you can join. So a number of the people that have joined Carly and me on our Habits for a Better World project are an example of that. They are volunteers. They do it in addition to their role. And they, I think, from what I hear from a number of them, are really enjoying together doing work that is going to make a difference in the world. And they also spend a lot of time with people that have like minds, that are kindred spirits. And there's a real enjoyment to each having a particular objective for improving things in the world and doing that with a whole bunch of people that feel the same way, whether it's that project that I'm talking about here or whatever it is that is the most meaningful for you to deliver on kind of the purpose and meaning that is meaningful to you. So you can join an existing organization. You can ask your family and friends for recommendations and like as well. So that's number two. So number one was really doing that deathbed test, getting a handle on what you think is the most important to you, and then considering whether your job satisfies that or not, and whether you want to change jobs. The second was to really try to reframe your role, and then also to consider going to a volunteer organization to satisfy your needs as well. And the last recommendation I would make, when you go back to that same statement that I said before, of somebody should do something about that, why not me? If there's something that is really important to you and you're not able to find another volunteer organization, for example, that you can join, do it yourself. There's great enjoyment in just doing it yourself. And some of that can be even just continuing to do it by yourself as well. Maybe like some of the things that I mentioned earlier that I've been doing. But you can also try to get your friends and colleagues to help with you on that as well. It can be anything that is meaningful to you. So I would suggest that you go through the recommendations that I just made and really 
understand what would make you happy in going beyond just feeding your wallet and also feeding your soul. I know that some of you will say, but Carl, I don't have time for this. I think that the Seth Godin quote that my guest Joe Byerly shared a few episodes ago is relevant here as well. You don't need more time. You simply need to decide. And I think this Stephen R. R. Covey quote is relevant too. The key is not to prioritize what's on your schedule, but to schedule your priorities. It's all about, at this time in your life, realizing that you need to prioritize this in order to satisfy your current experience, as well as when you look back on your life and therefore don't have any regrets either. I also wanted to mention before finishing up that since I retired some three months ago, I've heard a lot of requests from a number of you for me to provide sort of coaching, one-on-one coaching services. This podcast has been an interesting experience in that my voice goes into your headphones typically. It's one way. Yes, you can send me email and the like, but it's not the same as working interactively. And my time at IBM, I would mentor and coach many, many, many people. And so now that I am no longer at IBM, I'm also providing that service for just a few time slots a week. But you can go to my website, carlvradenberg.com slash coaching, and you can see more about it and actually just book time with me there as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your attention to this session. I'd like to ask you to contribute what you can financially, either as a one-time payment with our tip jar, or better yet, select a recurring monthly contribution. Just click on the tip jar link or the support the podcast link in the show notes. You can also go to our website, lifehabitspodcast.com and click on the support the podcast tab. Doing that will ensure that Paige and I will be able to continue to bring this podcast to you each week. I've never had advertising or asked for contributions during my previous 16 years because it wasn't my job. This is Paige's job. And so I would greatly appreciate it if you could consider contributing financially to the podcast. Thanks so much. Visit our website, lifehabitspodcast.com to sign up for our newsletter, get in touch with us and find our social media pages. If you love our podcast, please give us a rating in the app you're listening to us on, follow us and share us with your friends. And with that, Paige and I would like to thank you for listening to our podcast. We hope you found it helpful. We appreciate you. We'll talk to you next time and bye for now.